Do it again. Of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world. You're listening to Drinks, Jokes, and Storytelling. The martini, shaken, not stirred. Don't try and church it up, son. You can't handle the truth. I am the, the picture that got small. Your first one's on us. Folks, you're watching Drinks, Jokes, and Storytelling. I'm your host, Mark Rigadon, and with me as always... Ritzy Byrne! Oh, buddy, we got a good one today. The episode 68 we're up to. 68. Oh, my God. How ironic that we have Gino Vento for episode 69 tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I like that our episode counts about halfway to your age. <laughs> It is a good show. Um, I think we got to get right into it. We got uh, yeah. we have a lot to do today and a lot to talk about. So, yes. uh, um, yeah, let's get the guests in and then we'll talk. So uh, this we have a very special guest. This very, guy, very, very special. He's he's good friends with both of us separately, and then we all found out we're all a big happy yeah. family in different eras of our lives. Yeah, that's right. Different parts of Jay's career. Without I know when further he was a young whippersnapper. When he was just a young and let's bring him out, ladies and gentlemen, the very funny, the always, always on time, Jay Black. Jay Black. <laughs> no, no better compliment a comedian can receive than this guy's um, always on time. That's why I gave it to you. <laughs> <laughs> this guy right here. What a what the, I, I, I I've you. always said. The worst thing you can hear that another comedian said about you is that you're a nice guy. Because, like, if you're That's hanging out in comics and you bring up someone's name and the person's not funny, like, if it's the person's funny, you go, oh, that guy, he's so good. Oh, I love that guy. But if you bring him up and every comic goes, oh, yeah, hey, yeah, what a great guy. Love that guy. It means he well, sucks. Jay, he I always tell people you're an asshole. So <laughs> That's, That's high like praise, that. Richie. That's how Thank much you. I love your act. <laughs> How are so, you? Are we, are we? I'm good. Are we allowed to curse on this? I don't want yeah, to get kicked are. off Facebook. No, yeah. we're allowed. We're allowed. I I know that Mark's uh, faulty coronavirus advice is more likely to get you kicked off. <laughs> yeah. Anything I say, do not take as fact, and anything that I tell as a story, uh, it's guaranteed it's probably not true. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent. Yeah. Especially if if you've had sex in the story. Yeah. No, actually, that's what I do believe. Mark, you know, he was quite a coxman. <laughs> what do you mean, was? <laughs> well, I don't know what you and he do in your spare time, Richie. <laughs> we do more yellow. So, <laughs> Jay, the, way, the way we start off every show is with a drink. And uh, knowing you, I'm figuring you're not drinking. I'm not. I don't have any. I don't have a hey, drink with really me. Really screwed this up early, Mark. What are you drinking? I've got a key lime uh, Lacroix. Yeah. That's okay. Right. That's what you, you can drink. That I'm going with a Stella Artois. Oh, nice. Ooh. I'm going with an old school, just a little Coors Light tonight. You know, because yeah. I've gained weight since this quarantine. Oh, is that is that I, what did it, Richie? No, no, the quarantine, the Spanish flu quarantine. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell, Richie. I couldn't well, tell. Somebody told me I hadn't heard this. Have you guys heard about the quarantine fifteen? No. That, yeah, it's the like the freshman fifteen. My friend Judy told the quarantine fifteen means you're going to gain fifteen pounds during the quarantine, and I'm pretty sure I'm, I've got the quarantine fifty going. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I well, got the what, fifteen Richie, on day two. Richie, you're always prepared. You put that weight on before the quarantine. That's right. I knew it was coming, Jay. I knew it was <laughs> yeah. coming. You're like, this This quarantine, I got to start eating I, now. I'm doing I'm the ready. hibernation. So I'm doing the Coors Light today. and uh, I thought you did it because you're like Smokey and the Bandit, and you have to run to Denver to pick up a truckload of Coors and bring it back so we no, can have a party with I the – I think John uh, Deloise with the elephant at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Hey guys, this uh, this show is really a uh, cutting edge with the references. We, we try and stay current, Jay. Yeah. Hey, and I, I got I got some really good Cannonball Run shit ready to like roll our later. Seventy eight references. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and then we do a street joke. Do you have any street jokes? They can be dirty. They can be anything you want. I got a street joke that Steve Bix gave to me. Stop it. 
Personal hero. Personal hero, Steve Bix. Uh, have you talked about Steve Bix on the show? We have not. not. No. It's, it's amazing. I, I guess he's not like a, as current in comedians' minds anymore. But for he a is, long time, you yeah. couldn't find a guy who couldn't do a Steve Bix impression. Everybody. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, he was uh, like George W. Bush of, of com comedy bookers now. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you uh, who are not comedians watching this, which I can't imagine there are many, uh, there, Steve Bix was a comedy booker in the area, and he, he was like the king of VFW halls. And uh, not only that, he was a repugnant human being in all respects. <laughs> Just awful. Uh, he was the guy that would, like, call you up and tell you a story, and in that story, he would be the asshole but because he was telling you the story, he expected you to side with him. Right? Like, like he would be telling you a story about how he was obviously very racist. And they'd be like, can you believe they called me a racist? And at the end of it, you could only go, yeah, no, because that was so racist of what you did. Do you, know what, I, do you know what's funny, Jay? We have had a Steve Bix reference before. Really? And it was when Vinny Nardiello was on. So it's ironic that you and Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> when we were working back 15 years ago, when I was working with you guys all the time, it was Steve Bick's story after Steve Bick's story. And I just thought that was because at the time, that's who you were working for. It turns out you and Vinny are completely obsessed with Steve Bix. You, know, you actually you, did a TV show about him. We have to talk about that. Oh, yeah. We were going to do a reality show about Steve Bix. <laughs> We figured it had, I, you know what? It, it was too crazy. I think it was like Tiger King is as crazy as you can go. You can't go beyond Tiger yeah, King. Steve and, Bix uh, way beyond Tiger Steve King. Bix was, so Steve, uh, first off, Steve would always uh, look at my schedule. That and show would have been me. called, that show would have been called Sexy Tiger King. <laughs> Sexy Tiger King. Yeah. It would be like if, uh, if the only people treated worse than Tigers in Captivity is uh is comedians under Steve Bix. So Bix, <laughs> Bix used to uh, Bix used to call me to to work his rooms, but he would check my calendar because it was at the time like I didn't want to work for him anymore. But he would always trick me because he'd be like, Jay, what are you doing in three weeks? And I'd be like, uh, and I couldn't lie fast enough. He's like, good, you can do my room on Friday. And he would always <laughs> lie about how far away it is. He's like, you know how close it is. Go out your window. Look out your window. Do you see your mailbox? That's where the show is. And you'd be like, all right. And then you'd get it, and it would be like in Beirut. And you'd be like, I, I, Steve, I can't go to Beirut. Anyway, I had to do a, a clean show, and Steve Bick said, if you get into trouble, this is my clean show uh, go-to. It is a saver. Do this joke, and it will save you. So this is Steve Bix's joke, clean show saver. Uh, all right, let's see if I can remember it now. Uh, uh, Pope is sitting in his Pope house and he gets a call uh, from Kentucky Fried Chicken and Kentucky Fried Chicken says, uh, hey Pope we want to give the Catholic Church a million dollars. And the Pope goes oh that's great, thank you. He goes, But can you change daily bread to daily chicken? And the Pope goes, I, I, I'm sorry it's a prayer, it's been a longer time, I can't do that. So a little time goes by, I call back and they say, Pope, we, we want we want to help the Catholic Church. Ten million dollars, daily bread, daily chicken, and it shows Pope because I it, again I can't. It's too much. A uh, little bit of time goes by. Pope calls in. Uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken calls back and said, "Pope, last offer one hundred million dollars, daily bread, daily chicken." Pope goes, "I I can't turn that down. The good I can do with that." So he, he hangs up the phone. He calls all the uh, cardinals around. He goes, "Guys, I got good news and I got bad news." Good news is I just made the church $100 million. Bad news is we lost the Wonder Bread account. <laughs> Steve Bix, everybody. <laughs> and it was a long way to go, just like your trips to a Steve Bix game. Yeah. <laughs> you, see the, you see the mailbox? That's where the punchline is, Jay. And then as it turns out, I got a hairy dog that and one. It, and the punchline is in Beirut. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's where Steve Bix is now, fighting now, on the other side. I've been informed that, and it, I was hoping it would come up, but I've been informed that Vinny Nardiello is listening. Yeah, I see it right there on the private chat. So I'd be the, so I say we really make fun of Vinny Nardiello for a while. Oh, I can't do that. He'll text me all sad stuff. <laughs> How can you do that to me, Jay? Boop, 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 boop. Yeah, look, oh, yeah, no, I got, a, I got a sad emoji already. What am I going to do? Gonna, let's have a... Uh, 
both of you guys do your Vinny Nardiello impressions one at a time, and let's have the viewer. <laughs> <laughs> Jay and I used to Jay and I used to talk about Vinny and or we talk about like Jay would say, uh, hey man, we wrote this sketch and Vinny said that you should play this part, but we would just it, we were so used to doing Vinny that we just add that bubba at the end. Like, <laughs> you should play this part, bu -bu -bu. A bu -bu -bu. That was all we do. Bu -bu -bu. You know what? I'll, I'll put this in a way that'll make Vinny happy. He was our beaker. You know, like that <laughs> beaker for the Muppets. Vinny, you're our beaker. But we love you, Vinny. <laughs> um, uh, so before we start, I just want to say yesterday, Joel, uh, Joel, Jay, I don't know if you know this, but we had Jimmy Cano on. He's the doorman at uh, Gotham Comedy Club. Okay. And he, uh, he, uh, I'm about to say that, Joel, Joel, that's funny. He, um, he got the coronavirus and we had him on from his hospital. Oh, geez. And he, uh, he's doing a much, much better. And he wrote me about an hour ago and said, Hey, I'm home. Oh, that's so, fantastic. Yeah. Big shout out, Mark. Yeah. And, and it's funny because Jenna, his wife just posted it here, but Jimmy Cano's home. Anybody. Thank you for watching yesterday. I mean, we had everybody that was, we had an amazing night of views and Jimmy was amazing. And uh, with, we're so happy you're home, Jimmy, get better. Yeah, Keep getting man. So do, um, uh, do we know, are you, after you get coronavirus, are you immune to it? Do they, don't they, know. Like, they don't know that yet. They okay. Don't know that. They don't Cause know I, I would imagine it's terrible to get it, but if you can get through it and get to the other side, it must be kind of a relief that, you know, you yeah. can't get it. I don't think they're not sure about that. Yeah. You know, so if I had that, I just walk around licking people. I just be licking everybody. Like I can't get it. Go what are ahead. You one of, what are you one of the bushwhackers? <laughs> I, I'm like hacksaw Jim Duck, and I come in with the two by four, and I say, "Hey, you spit in my mouth. It's okay." I um, I have to say, I have enjoyed. I don't know if you have seen it. These people who are licking toilet bowls and things, and then they're getting it. No, it's the best. It, it, it's the uh -huh. best. It's the best. It's it's like God's little joke. Like guys are licking, you know, aisles in, in the in the supermarket, uh, licking the cans and, and stuff. And then they, this guy got it. You're like, good. He deserves to get it. Yeah. You know what? The the virus doesn't know it's a YouTube prank, bro. <laughs> the virus is just a virus. It doesn't play politics. You just you just gonna die now, and none of us are sad about it. <laughs> Do they have any? Uh, did anybody make a video of the people that lick toilet seats and then them in the hospital bed? Oh, that would no. be wonderful. I mean, you, could, you could play the same Sarah McLaughlin song from the Sad Puppy sh uh, commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Just, oh, the angel. The yeah. angel. <laughs> oh, the angel. <laughs> it's like you two can sponsor an asshole. <laughs> um, so, Jay Black. I have known you a very long time. Yes, we go back to the 1850s. We, we do. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I want to tell you a story. I was doing, uh, and Mark, I was doing a, uh, I was doing the Richie Burns show back then, and uh, every few months, brand new show, and you know it had all different sketches. Yeah. And, and I had worked before that. I had worked a club in Pennsylvania, uh, and something happened. I was at this club, and three of the five nights, three of the five shows that I did. A fight broke out in the audience. Are you and, serious? Yeah, and the club owner blamed me for the fights. And he wasn't even in the room when it happened. It was a whole thing. And I'm like, I, I, you know, he. so needless to say, they stopped using me at the club for a few years. And then my manager got me back in to the club. And the week before, I was going to – and you know when you got to do a gig and you know it's going to suck and you don't want to go and, like – it's all the gigs I've ever done, Richie. <laughs> but you know, it screws up the week. Like, it's all you're thinking about. Oh, I got to go to that club next weekend. So I was at Hilarities in Cleveland, which is a great club. I don't know if yeah. you guys ever worked at Hilarities. Yeah. Great. Yeah, many times. And I was with Mike Stankiewicz. Shout out to Thank Mike. Thank you, Mike. And I spent the whole week with Stanky going, oh, next week I got to do that club. And oh, I don't want to. And at one point, Stankiewicz turns and goes, there's a reason you're going there. That's all he said. He goes, there's a reason you're supposed to be there. And I get to the club, and it's the first night, and I'm sitting at a table, and I'm, like, sitting there going, oh, God, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. 
and up comes this goofy kid. Burn. <laughs> He's like, I'm your MC. And he goes, my name's Jay Black, and I'm really happy to be here. You were like, oh, my God. Yeah. And I go, yeah, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, you know, I'm really looking forward to doing the show. And this is back. This is not the Jay we know now. And <laughs> Hey, I'm still and, a nice guy. How dare you? And Jay went up. That's how I would describe you. Jay went up <laughs> at the MC and lit this room, Mark. Like, you, he just destroyed this room every night to the point where the middle act couldn't follow him. And, nice. I, and I was like, my God, this kid's amazing. And I said to him, I go, do you write sketch? Have you ever written sketches? He goes, are you kidding? That's all I did in college. And he yeah. said, I got a writing partner. And, but, and the next thing I knew I had Vinny and Thorniello <laughs> and Jay Black. We were writing these great sketches for the Richie Byrne show for the next year, year and a half. And how much fun did we have? We had a blast. Richie, I like to think of myself as the cigarettes and Vinny as the cancer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. You took a you took a long drink. Is that Bix? No, it's Rod Reyes. Hi, Rod. Oh, Bix is Bix. in Florida. Great comment. <laughs> Bix is in Florida. Thank you, Rod. Yeah. Licking toilet seats. <laughs> Licking toilet seats. <laughs> and um, but then and then um, you just you blew it up, man. You started doing the colleges, and you did. You were you were just blowing it up from there. I, and I, I, I'm so happy for all your success, man. I really am. I, I appreciate that. I, I always tell stories uh, about you, Richie, because you were my mentor. I mean, for real. Like, we spent like a year and a half on the road together yeah. me featuring for you. Yeah, which... I usually tell stories of Richie, but it's just because he's a mess. Oh, a total mess. <laughs> he he is he is the, the best and most wonderful, lovable degenerate on the planet Earth. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I would like a couple of things that Richie would uh, always tell me. Uh, the that weekend when we were together at the Villa Villa East was that the name of it? Village East, Village, Village Lantern. East. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In in, in Lancaster. Yeah, in Lancaster. I, was, I wasn't going to say the name, but yeah. Oh, well, it's not there anymore. So yeah. yeah. Uh, but Rich, like the manager came out and said, "How did the show go?" And I started answering like, "Oh, you know." At first, I thought I didn't have him. And then, like five minutes in, I felt like I got him a little bit. And then I, I by the end, it was real solid. And Richie just kind of put a hand on my chest and said, "He killed." And then he turned to me and said, "If the manager's not in the room and asks you how you did, you always say you killed. You don't tell him how you did. You tell him that you killed." Right. And I learned you that lesson. Say yes, Ray. Well. That's <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. You know who? You know who taught me that? Joe Matteries. Joe Matteries, really? I was I was at Stand Up New York, and I didn't think I did a good job. It was a long time ago, and I, I you know, because you know, I always do a good job now. Uh, I was at Stand Up New York, and I came off the stage, and I like walked off, and I went fuck, like you know, like shit. And and Matteries grabbed me, and he goes, "What are you doing?" I go, "I'm just pissed. I had a bad set." He goes, "They don't know that. They don't know that. Right. You always had a good set, yeah. and that really <laughs> stuck with me, you know." There is another thing you said, Richie. This is a bit of advice I always give. You said that there's four levels of being a stand-up comic. Let me do this. Four levels. You said, I hope I'm funny. I think I'm funny. I know I'm funny. I don't give a shit if I'm funny or not. Right. Yeah. And he said, once you get to this, and I, I always repeat it, I always give you credit, not like the jokes I steal from you. Uh, <laughs> you say, uh, once you get to, I don't give a shit if I'm funny or not, that's the moment that you're actually going to kill Right. Because you've you've gone through it all and you stopped being needy. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're all needy, but the second you can get beyond the audience knowing that you're needy, mm -hmm. that's when you do well. That always stuck with me. I, and the last thing I always did, Richie, is I always knew I had a good set because every time you'd fool me by standing in the hallway after the set, and I walk out and you go, Where do you think you lost him? <laughs> and uh, I fell for it every goddamn time. Like, oh, I, I thought I did well. And you're like, you did well. I was just messing with you. Unlike Vinny Nardiello, who I'd stand in the room going, oh, man, he lost him. He'd come up and go, I killed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Did you bump, bump, bump. I did great. Bump, 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 bump. <laughs> it wasn't me. It was the audience. Bump, bump, bump. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, he's going to be so mad. I, at you, I'm defending him. You're not. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're doing a great job. I'm defending him. Look at Mark being quiet. <laughs> your collaborator, Mark. Your Vici France. Look at you. So, um, but then you 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 blew up with the colleges, and you. 
actually, Jay and I had a lot of fun one summer with Dan Schechter. Oh, yeah. I just um, saw Dan like three weeks ago. Dan how's he doing? Know. He's doing great. He just directed a new movie with Justin Long. Uh, it's, it's he's doing fantastic. We we hung out in the city. He's a good dude. That's Miss great, Dan. man. I love Dan. He Dan Schechter wrote a movie called Goodbye Baby, back a, and um, he auditioned comics at Dangerfield. Yes. To he wanted because it was about a girl from Long Island who was going to go into the city and, and be, be a comic. And right. Christina Evangelista played the lead. I can't believe you remember that. Actually, no, I do re I do believe you yeah. remember that. And she, um, so he needed someone to write material for her because it was yeah. a real movie. Everybody, It was a big cast. It was some cast. Yeah, we had and, Fred Armiston was in that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Donnell and, Rawlings was in that. Yeah, and, um, and some big actors, too. I mean, really big. Like, Christina was a big actress. Sure. And um, so he went to Dangerfields and watched these acts. I was away and couldn't be there to audition. And Jay was the one guy he wanted to write this. And and he and Jay Jay was so great, you go, you gotta get Richie Byrne. <laughs> and he goes, No, I, I want you. And Jay goes, No, you gotta get Richie Byrne. And then the guy watched my tape. Dan watched my tape and he said, No, this guy writes too much personal. It's I need and Jay said, you really need Richie Byrne. And they ended up hiring both of us. Yeah, it was a fun and summer. The three of us spent the whole summer writing material for different comics in the show, in the movie. Yeah. And we, I, the three of us would go around to the cellar and uh, wherever, Stand Up New York, ever, and so we could show. I mean, he had a good feel for it then, and I thought he did a tremendous job with this movie. It's a yeah, shame the movie was bigger. It was such a good movie. He wrote it, and, he, and it was the first movie he directed. You know, I think he just missed out on like the whole backs, like did. the whole uh, Mark Marin, like the 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 other side of comedy, like what that's like. He missed that by like three years. Yeah, he did. It, just, right. it was a little bit ahead of its time, he was and I think ahead of its time. Yeah. If and it came out now, I think there's a, probably a real market for like yeah. what it would be like to be a young woman starting out in the city. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. A couple of things out of that story. Number one, Richie, I like to think of you and me as the Barry Sobel of 2006. Because <laughs> as you know, Barry Sobel wrote all the material for Punchline. Yes. That's and played the, right. He did. Yeah. yeah. And, and the funny thing is, is that he put us in the movie. Yeah. Just, we just like movie. Barry Sobel. We were Barry Sobel. We were Barry Sobel. And um, he actually, we had to do a day of shoots in front of Mark, in front of extras. At, the, at a at a fake comedy club, and all the everybody had to get up and do time, and I ended up having to warm up the whole thing. I did the whole. Do you remember that, Jay? I was I like, do. and that was, was that the, where the you first, got your start. Warm the first up warm up I ever did. I had to warm up these extras, and they were hysterical because they would laugh really hard when they knew the camera was rolling, but they knew the camera <laughs> wasn't rolling when I was on. So Save they were my like, energy. They, yeah. yeah, they'd lose their energy, but then he ended up using me in it anyway, which I thought was funny. And we we had a great – and then there was a scene where Fred Armisen wanted – he – um I shouldn't tell this story because it's long, but – and I think I told him before, but Fred felt his character wouldn't be at the table when – Right, um, yes. Uh, oh, uh, uh, whoever it was was giving her a hard time because Fred felt there was another scene. Oh, Sal about. the Stockbroker. Sal, Sal the Stockbroker. Sal Governale, right. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and Sal was great. Sal was great in that. And Fred talked his way out of the scene because he yeah. felt his character wouldn't sit there and listen to them make fun of her. His and, character uh, disliked us as much as he did, apparently. And Dan, <laughs> Dan came over to me and he said, what do I do here? He doesn't want to be in the scene. And I go, he's right. I said, he's right. He wouldn't sit there and let us make fun of or her, uh, Sal make fun of her that way. So he got out of the scene. And the next day, Fred came up to me and he goes, hey, man, I didn't mean to be like a pain in the ass last night. I wasn't trying to be a pain in the ass. And I go, dude, you're the first actor I ever saw who talked himself out of a movie. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. He, he wanted, he wanted, uh, I always say you can tell a, 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 a pro comic from an amateur comic because amateur comics always ask for more time. Pro comics always ask for less time. That's great. That's a great point. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Oh, you want me to do 38? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, no problem. That's uh, Whereas there's features like, I can do 50 if you need it. 
Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> by the way, the other thing that I, I remember about that is that Danger Fields in 2006 is exactly like Danger Fields today. And what I mean is during the coronavirus, there's no difference <laughs> of a shutdown Danger Fields with coronavirus. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it's still the same as in The Joker. Yeah, oh, was that, from like the Danger early Fields in the yeah, Joker. yeah, that's that's danger for yeah. yeah. Oh my god, imagine there you're scouting a comedy club and you need to have something that uh you know takes the 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 feeling of decadent 1970s end of the road New York and they go danger fields perfect. <laughs> it, change it at no all. set design here. <laughs> yeah, we don't even <laughs> set designer, just leave it, stay at home. We got it. This is perfect as is. I had a problem with that scene in the Joker too. I I thought that they, they would never put the guy on the show the next day and all that. That was a bit much. Well, I think that's why it it might be in his head, Richie, because the other thing is this is 1980. Who has recording equipment in 1980 that yeah. he was filmed? Was it like some guy with See, like I, a giant it, setup? It's funny you say that because I thought, oh, this whole thing's in his head. Yeah. And then I thought, oh wait, that got really serious there with the, yeah. you know, but I don't know. I don't want to give away the movie. Here's so, all I'm going to say. What are you uh, laughing at, Rick Adana? <laughs> I love that Jay just brought up, like, the plot of the movie, and Richie's like, yeah, I was kind of thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bro, I was totally thinking that, bro. <laughs> bro, I totally thought they were dead oh, after bro. I watched the movie. I thought it was a Jacob's Ladder, bro. You could totally go. <laughs> 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 Oh, Guys, are we, are we going to reference any movies from the 21st century? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Jake well, Richie, Ladder, no. Smokey and the Bandit. Well, Richie's first well, movie was three the of us. Nickelodeon. <laughs> 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 and I remember when I watched Chaplin. No, I'm yeah. kidding. Um, <laughs> so now you, the other thing you do, or Mark, do you want to get in on this? Or you want, yeah. you're having, you all right? Because Mark and I do this thing where one of us takes the lead right. for each show, depending Mark. on who the guest is. And today we both kind of fought over who's going to take the lead because we both wanted to take the lead with you. Well, I'm just going to say this. Mark, I uh, want to talk about referencing movies. Vinny, who's watching at home, will really like this. Mark is uh, the guy who filmed the Hogan's Hero guy, the Bob Crane guy. You're Bob <laughs> Crane, Richie. You're Willem Dafoe. You're Greg Kinnear. I just felt in the moment, guys. Yeah. I just felt in the moment. I just to watch. I, I just film it. I'm just filming, guys. <laughs> but you're, you're I, go ahead, go ahead, Mark. Oh, I was going to say. So, what happened where the transition uh, from stand up to now you're writing films and where shooting films and so, what, where was your transition? So, my buddy uh, Brian Hersley he got rid of me. Was that? Soon as he got rid of me, soon as no, I, I had to, you know, uh, in comedy terms, it's called getting rid of the dead weight, guys. Uh, <laughs> Jay was an dropped anchor. about three hundred pounds. <laughs> there was an Irish potato wrapped around my neck like an anchor. I had to, I had to cast it off. No, my, <laughs> an Irish. Shut yeah. up. <laughs> my uh, my buddy Brian Herslinger had uh, uh, he went out to L.A. And long story short, he was failing tremendously in L.A. And he, he decided he was going to go out and get a video camera back when you had to get them. They didn't just come free with your phones and uh, yeah. film a documentary of he gave himself 30 days to get a date with Drew Barrymore. And if you remember, this was like right around the time of like Morgan Spurlock and like the the stunt documentary. Super sad. So they caught lightning in a bottle. He got on Jay Leno and he did like 40 appearances on Jay Leno after that because he was so good on Leno. He got an agent at, uh, uh, I want to say CAA, but I, I'm getting that wrong. It was like a big time agency. And they said, like, what's your follow up? Like, what do you want to do next? You, you have this big thing. What's next? And he didn't know what was next. Like, he had a couple ideas. And I just happened to be in L.A. to visit. And we took a walk. Uh, holding hands because it was pre coronavirus, you could now do it's that. Six feet, six feet, and now it's six feet. Man, so we'd have to date Monday, <laughs> yeah. So we, we walked and uh, we just chatted about his ideas, and I started fleshing them out with him. And by the time we got done the walk, he was like, Hey, why don't we just write together? Because he got good ideas, and from there, mm -hmm. we just started writing screenplays. And the first one we wrote was a tremendous piece of. shit. It was so bad. To this day, I have it's like 240 pages 
And it's awful. It's a 240 page comedy. So we sent that to his agent and he said, this never. is what the world needs. Yeah, exactly. It was, uh, but, it was, by the way, for people who don't know, one page is a minute. Right. So, so that's this, a four hour comedy. Yeah, this is a Godfather five level comedy here, guys. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the second one we wrote, like in my head, I was like, nothing's ever going to happen anyway. So I, I just wrote and Richie, you know, like, you and I, when we're off camera, Mark, you and I, when we're off camera, we're funny on camera, but we're insanely awful off camera, but funny, insanely awful funny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like most comics. Right. So uh, yeah. I wrote the insanely awful part down <laughs> and we sent that out and we got like 40 phone calls. People were calling us. I read your script. It's the funniest script I've ever read. Oh my God, great. You're going to make it. Oh, I showed it to my boss. He never wants to meet you. He thinks you're terrible. They, they thought it was the worst <laughs> thing ever, but I loved it. So like all the 20 year olds working at these places loved it, but all the bosses hated it. But when they started moving up, they remembered us. So like it took a couple of years, but after that happened, we started getting phone calls from like the lower executives who moved up. And from there, we just, you know, started getting stuff made. So it's, it's been so pretty cool. So basically, you're the De Palma for the Maxim generation. That, that's actually what I want on my tombstone, Mark. The De Palma <laughs> for people who whack at the bikini pics. <laughs> here's, here's Adelson Hannigan dressed as a schoolgirl. Have fun. <laughs> so... Uh, I guess the, the thing I'd like to ask is on all your projects that you worked on, what are some of the one moments that like insanely stuck out that you're like, this is something that I, I want to talk about on the couch at Leno, but then it's like, you know, the show didn't take off. So you didn't get the thing. Cause what a lot of people don't know is projects. One, if you got one in a hundred projects, that's a good batting. Answer. Yeah. And that's actually something you have to learn to, to do. Like when you're in the business is like when you're talking to people outside the business, you always sound like a bullshitter because you, you go like, Oh my God, I just met with so-and-so they love it. We're going to make this movie together. It's wonderful. And then like eight months go by and people go like, whatever happened to that? And you go, Oh yeah, no, they never called me back. And they're like, Oh, you're such a bullshitter. And you go, no, that's the nature of the business that's, is yeah. People telling you that they love you and then never calling you back. It's right. basically the business is like dating a comic. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll, t I'll tell you, this uh, is, is a story that uh, when I was still drinking and doing drugs, um, my brother died. And uh, that's not the funny part. Um, he uh, he he died, and uh, what I've discovered is Hollywood producers only have about this much empathy. So, like, I was in grieving, and I hadn't done any work on the script, and we had a deadline coming up. So, I was in hilarities in Cleveland, Richie, and I got a call from the the producer like on a Friday morning, or Saturday morning, and he was like, "Hey, uh, so sorry to hear about your brother." And I was expecting him to go that mud Monday deadline. Don't worry about it. He was like, yeah, but that mud Monday deadline, you got to hit it or, you know, you're, you know, we're going to take your money back or sue you. So I was like, oh, shit. So uh, I took a whole bunch of Adderall and I took a whole bunch of alcohol and I stayed up all night, Saturday night, writing the script. And it was this insane first draft that I wrote. It was a it was an action movie called The Bus Driver. It was Robert Forrester was in it. He wasn't the action star. He he was our cameo, but uh, it was my Jackie Brown. Uh, so I I wrote it basically in a night. I think I did some Sunday, but I was I was drunk and I was high and I was crying because my brother had just died, and I was like, let me write a script that my brother would like. And what would my brother like? He would like killing and boobs. So I wrote an old school 1980s throwback action movie with killing and boobs. Like it was like a canon movie. I sent it to my writing partner. Was that? Yeah. Uh, uh, killing and boobs. The Jay Black story. Uh, I sent it to my writing partner. He did a gloss on it because it was due the next day. And I, in my brain, I was like, okay, I got the first draft to them. There's no possible way that they're they're not going to want like massive rewrites. But I bought myself some time. I didn't hear from him 
for like months. So I was like in my brain, I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess we're not doing the rewrite. Thank God. Cause that thing was insane. And then I got a call. Uh, we're making it. And they were making it based on that draft. That was drinking, drugging, crying, grieving right for my brother in one night draft. And to this day, I'll go to Amazon and read the reviews of the movie. The movie's called The Bus Driver. For a long time, it was available free on Amazon Prime. I think you got to buy it now. I'm not sure. Uh, it might be on iTunes. But uh, if you watch that movie, the reviews, half of the reviews are, this is the worst piece of shit that has ever been produced in the history of cinema. And the other half are five star. Oh, my God. This is such a loving, like, uh, pastiche. Of, of action movies from the 80s. These guys get it, and they're like using a limited budget to show all the stuff that they love. So it's like really polarizing, but in the way that I love more than anything. And I, I still have trouble watching the movie because of the headspace that I was in when I wrote it. But it's kind of an amazing thing where you put all this work and effort into stuff that never gets made, and then you spend one night in the worst kind of position you've been mentally in your life, and you bang out this script that, is people kind of dug. So uh, it's it's called The Bus Driver, Robert Forrester. Check it out. So it's, it's a to me, one. it sounds like you just explained probably what Quentin Tarantino does on all of his films. <laughs> yeah. Well, he has to murder somebody to get that grieving feeling, and then he just goes and, to it. No, he it's has funny. the money to do it, though. Oh, yeah. No, it's, funny. <laughs> it's funny, Jay, because I really didn't know you. When, when I knew you, you'd have a smeared off ice, and we'd have to carry you home. Yeah, yeah, no, comedy comedy took a left turn in my yeah. life for a while, Richie. And, and I remember people would say to me, hey, man, have you been in touch with Jay Black? And I'm like, no. And they're like, oh, man, he's got issues. I'm like, no. No, no, no. no. He's a mess. No, I was a mess. <laughs> well, but, but you do your I know it now. Yeah, four years. Doing God well. Bless. God bless, man. I mean, I you think know after this podcast – Possibly it'll be uh, time to fall off the wagon, well, but uh, it was a good run. Uh, you, you wouldn't be the first. <laughs> you know which Jay Black you're talking to by his weight. Oh, when you were yeah. when you were partying, you weighed like about as much as me. And oh. then when you're not partying, you're all spilt and thin. Yeah, it's uh, when I'm when I can't put chemicals in my body, I lift weights. So that's yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm ba I'm basically like uh, what do you call it? like what's a TV show you can judge with? I'm like Friends. You go depending on Matthew Perry's weight, you can tell where he's at. So I'm what year was? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm the Chandler Bing of the comedy cir uh, circuit. I was gonna say you're like the Incredible Hulk, like when you're all big and puffy, you're like, oh, he's using. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the and Incredible then, Hulk didn't droop as much on his chest. <laughs> More like the Incredible Sulk. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh. I thought you were going bulk, but then you hit no. me with the Sulk, and I was happy. Oh, uh, Jesus so Christ. What's going on now, Jay? So I actually have a Lifetime movie that I wrote coming out at the end of May. Okay. Uh, okay. Is this the one you're in? No, I'm not in this one. I, I would I have a part that I wrote for myself which, that uh which blows I, my mind. I couldn't be there for it. Uh so I'm not in this one. Okay, because Mark, I gotta tell you something. I heard that he wrote a movie and put himself in it. Yeah. And back in the day, we did a sketch where Jay was in I, I put Jay in the sketch. Yeah. And all Jay said was, please don't put me in. You don't mm -hmm. want me. Yeah. No one wants to see me act. No right. one wants to see this. And he had like two lines. And he he played the, the Japanese emperor, if you remember. <laughs> yeah, and, that was back in the days when you could be racist everybody. No, and it was so <laughs> it was so offensive what he was doing. You'll but never be on you, Saturday Night Live. Jim. No, not now. I won't tell you who he based the character on, but it was a character he had off stage. But um but um, salary, remember salary? Sal oh no, uh, Vinny and I already we have a movie ready to go, but we're not talking about it. Not talking about it. Okay. So um, he's Mark. He's in rehearsal and he has to die in the scene. And as he's dying, he's apologizing for how bad an actor he is. <laughs> and we go, we go I'm, so, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I told Richie not. Oh, I see how bad I, it was. The funniest thing. So when I heard that you put yourself in a movie, I thought, oh my God, he's come a long way. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it was a long way of indulging my narcissism. Yes. Yes. Uh, 
Well, you know what I realized about acting, in all honesty, that I from from what I can tell, and I'm no actor, I, I've you know, I've I've been in a few movies, no biggie. Uh, but uh when you're one of the things that early on, it's the same as stand-up, is this idea that people are looking at me and I'm self-conscious. How do I like become this other person or say these words that everybody knows are made up words without feeling like a douche. And I, I yeah. think like at the time we were doing it, I'd only been doing comedy for a couple of years. <laughs> I hadn't been doing acting at all, but you get to the point where you can like do stuff in front of a group of people, like do comedy in front of a group of people. Acting's the same thing. You know, you can just not be worried that everybody thinks you're a douche. You should you should teach a class. Yeah, I'm going to teach that class. How to act and not be a douche. Well, it's I honestly think like you get lesson your, one: don't be a douche. Right no. Lesson two: learn your fucking lines. <laughs> lesson three: smoke them if you got them. I'm out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I'm not in this one. So I, that that's coming out at the end of May. It'll be on the Lifetime Movie Channel. I wrote a Lifetime movie, everybody. That, that's hysterical, too. It, yeah. It's a... I'm right. working Lifetime, Jay Black. It's a, it's a yoga thriller. I love thriller. it. Guys, it's a yoga thriller. It's about a, a murderous yoga teacher. Really? Called The Perfect Pose. Wow. And you Although, wrote it. I wrote it. Uh, this anybody was actually, anybody that? That we would know? Uh, probably not. If you watch a lot of Hallmark movies, you, you'll notice like we have some Hallmark all stars in this one. But if you don't, you probably don't know who they are. But that comes out at the end of May. Um, and it, the title might change because I think they they uh, emailed us, Lifetime emailed us and said we want to we want a little bit of a boppier name, like a little bit more of a thrillery name. So we sent them a whole bunch. So if you see a yoga killer, go oh that's Jay Black. Okay. I'm gonna think it's a rip off of your movie. Yeah, oh no, they're coming, Mark. They're coming. You don't want that uh that uh you know. yoga thrillers are gonna be the, the rage. Oh yeah, it'll be like uh, uh all the scary movie knockoffs. Uh so so I have that and then uh I recorded an album with helium. You know how the helium are doing the album things now? I don't know if you guys uh have, have had people on have done that, but that's coming out probably April-ish or early May-ish. And that'll be like on iTunes and Spotify and everything. It's called uh, Press F to Pay Respects. Oh, great. That's great. So that's that's the stuff I have going on right now. But like the, the majority of us, what I'm doing now is figuring out a way to sell blood to make up for all of the gigs that I lost. Yeah, it's been brutal. Yeah. 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 I, it just Every text I get from an agent or a manager starts with, now don't be upset. <laughs> we will move it to the fall and i'm like i i don't know the fall's looking pretty packed fellas i don't know Man. what's gonna happen here i just don't understand i lost a gig from 2022 that's really i don't <laughs> yeah. i don't know why you were booked for 2022 <laughs> they're like Rich, we're planning well they took a look at trump and said you know what 2022 probably still gonna have a coronavirus guy so <laughs> <laughs> well i think a good place to get out here mark what yeah, you, I was going to say, uh, we're going to wrap here. Jay, give us your plug so anybody watching. Okay, so important thing, first of all, I want to say, you know I can hear my own voice in these, so I don't want to stop talking. I don't no. know why we have this time. I mean, we could go another two hours. Oh, I, I know. I've spent time with you. I know. <laughs> I, uh, so, uh, by Jay the way, every time. Jay loves him some Jay. Every, what is that? Jay loves him some Jay. Oh, I just love hearing myself. I hate myself. I just love hearing my voice, Richie. Uh, so my plugs, jblack.tv, J-A-Y-B-L-A-C-K.tv is the, the website. Uh, I'm back on Twitter, so find me at jblackisfunny. It's a sentence, and it's true. J-A-Y-B-L-A-C-K-I-S-F-U-N-N-Y. It's also on the uh, Facebook page, or excuse me, on the uh, on the web page. You click there, click on a little Twitter link. Come be a follower of mine, because then I can quantify love. There you go. Likes equals like. No. Exactly. Your life. Okay, we're gonna do we're gonna do one more thing here. Do you want to stay on for it, or do you want to? You off? know what? I feel like I I didn't know him very well, so I think it'd probably be more respectful. And I'm trying as a someone who's been through the process. I have empathy now and try to make other people more important than myself, Richie. So I think it makes more sense if I'm not on. You got a lot of work to do. But, uh, <laughs> thanks for coming on. What happened to the kid I knew? Yeah, oh, it's been a long journey, Richie. Thanks, guys. This was a pleasure. Thanks for having Thank me. You guys are great. We love you, Jerry. We hope to have you back, man. Love you, too. Good Miss luck. you guys. Yeah.
We'll see you soon. Uh, so now we'll bring Joe back on, our buddy Joe, our fearless producer, looking sexy as ever there he is. And uh, Richie, do you want to take the lead on this? This was a close friend of yours. Yeah. Um, yesterday when we were on the air, ironically with Jimmy, my brother called. And uh, I, didn't, I obviously didn't pick up. And um, we finished the show. And I was feeling really good because I was so happy that Jimmy was doing so well. And he was, you know, we there was a point there where we thought we were going to lose him. And my mom called me and said, are you okay? I said, what are you talking about? And she said, Pete Michaels died. And Pete Michaels was a, uh, a ventriloquist and uh, a really funny cat. And um, back in the late 80s, there was a club in New York um, called Eagle Tavern. And that was the one open mic. There was a back room at the Eagle Tavern. And every Tuesday night, you went there and got on stage. Sometimes there were 100 people in that, in that night. Wow. Yeah. And you'd have to go sign in. And, I mean, that's where I met Wanda Sykes, um, uh, Greg Giraldo, Jim Florentine, um, J.R. Havlin, who writes for The Daily Show, has been writing for The Daily Show forever. And uh, the guy who ran that club was a guy named Tim Davis. And Tim was always saying to us, you guys, you're not going to get on in the big clubs. you got to find a room that will give you a night, and you'll get time. So go out, find a find a, a restaurant, find a bar, whatever, and get it, start doing open mics there. It was, you know, it, it, which now goes on all the time, but back then didn't happen as much. Right. <laughs> so he said to me, you're from Staten Island, right? I said, yeah. He goes, if you started a room in Staten Island, you could get the creme de la creme of the open micers to come because nobody's just going to show up. It's too far to go. So you could set up shows and get really good comics as long as you set them up. And I go, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no and he goes, call Pete Michaels. Because he, I said, I don't know Pete Michaels. He said, he said, you don't know Pete. So he gave me his number and I called Pete. Turned out Pete grew up right around the corner from me. Which is crazy. Such a small yeah. world. Turned out Pete was a drummer in a rock band at a, my brother booked the club where Pete played. My brother was in a band. They knew each other. Pete was a great drummer. And, um, and he said, dude, yeah. You know, so we met up and we started a show with my friend Mike Vizi every Thursday night at this bar I worked at, Harbor Lights. And we packed the place out every Thursday. And we brought in really good, really good people came over. They would come over on the ferry. We'd pick them up, drive over to Harbor Lights on Bay Street, do the show, and then drop them back off at the ferry. It was so cool. And Pete was the host, the MC, and with Woody D, his, uh, you know, his the dummy. And, um, and I... I headlined every show and it was one of the best times of my life. It was, you know, and Pete actually took me and got me my first road gig. I opened for him in Chicopee, Massachusetts. I was just about to ask if you remembered where it was. Yeah, I do. And, and we drove out and yeah. And, and we became really good friends at that time. I mean, he, I worked at that bar on Friday nights. It's, Pete would come every Friday night. We'd go out to, you know, the next morning at breakfast and we'd do all that. And we became really close. And just like with me and Jay, you, I started getting better and suddenly getting to a level that Pete was at. So we didn't see each other as much. And over the years, he started, people don't realize how talented this guy was. I mean, he was a ventriloquist, but he had an amazing singing voice. And he was an amazing drummer. And then he started a band a few years back with a Beatles cover band. I was going to say a Beatles tribute band. And yep. he was John Lennon. He he played guitar and sang. And his son, Pete, Pete, uh, Peter, his son, was George Harrison. The kid's an amazing guitarist and, and a, a great kid. And uh, Pete, Pete had a lot. I always talk about Greg Morton and Joey Cola. Pete was right up there with, with them in getting me started in the business. I knew his, I know his wife really well. I remember his first date with his wife. I mean, you know, we, we talked about that and, and uh, he was just a really great guy and he meant a lot to me. 
and he meant a lot to a lot of people in this business. He'd been around a long time, and he, he sadly passed away yesterday, and he went way too young. And well, I was just saying, he, he, he headlined uh, a bunch of times uh, for, for me, at, uh, um, <laughs> not only in, uh, in Staten Island for the Staten Island Comedy Festival, but also at the Valley Forge Casino. Um, he actually had a heart condition, Yes. And we helped raise money for him at the uh, the Looney Bin on Staten Island with, with Victor oh, Dorigo, right, right. the owner. And, and people that might not know him as well, he he had a uh, special needs daughter and still does. I wanted to talk about that, right? Yeah. There. So um, for, through Richie's suggestion, we're going to start a GoFundMe page uh, yeah. for him and his family, um, you know, to, so that we can help out in a small way for uh, during this time for any bills that they might have. Yeah, hopefully tomorrow we'll have better information on the GoFundMe. Uh, yeah. And which means Joel and Joey will do all the work and I'll take all the credit. Um, he, he, was a, he was a great guy, man. Very he, talented. He was a great guy. He also was an amazing uh, martial artist. His dad was a famous sensei. And and Pete became – he was – let me tell you a quick story. My my brother lived across the street from Pete when, he, when they were both around 30, 35. And my brother told his story. My brother – he wasn't much for giving people compliments. My brother tells a story about one day this guy and this girl got in an argument. It was the middle. It was late, too. It was late at night, like 10 at night on their street. They lived on a quiet street. And this guy is yelling at his girlfriend. And my brother went out to see what was going on. And he said before he could get out the door, Pete came out of his house and just said to the guy, why don't you calm down? And the guy turned and said, stay out of it. Stay out of it. And my brother said, I was ready. Like, I, I thought this was going to get ugly. And I was there. I was with. And he goes, the guy took a, a lug nut, the lug, the wrench, and, and went up at Pete like he was going to hit him. And my brother said, Pete just stood and just never moved. And the guy backed down. And my brother was like, you could see that Pete still had him sized up. There was no way this guy was going to – that's how like how, serious, how sure Pete was of himself. And my brother from that day on – my brother saw him in bands. My brother saw him do comedy. But all he could talk about from that day on was, dude, that guy backed down, man. That was amazing. Pete, <laughs> that's all he could talk about. That's so, awesome. Well, rest in peace, man. You. We're going to miss you, Pete. Yeah. Absolutely. God bless your family. Yep. yep. So I guess uh, that's strange jokes and storytelling. We're going to play a little something. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Last call. Thanks for listening to Drinks, Jokes, and Storytelling.